Now we get to our final Bernie Ecclestone uh, Formula One uh, <laughs> lectures for uh, this round. Uh, to the slipstream, transformations and media re uh, relations in Formula One. So, Professor, take it away. Thanks very much, and uh, what a story to follow. <laughs> that was brilliant by Bill. I really enjoyed uh, just the, uh, I don't know, the, the mystique, I guess, of a story like that is quite fascinating. And the, one of the things motorsport delivers in spades, I think, is are these kind of stories about uh, sort of heroic figures and, and uh, what it tells us about life in general, I think. So um, thanks for that, Bill. So my, my talk is based on a, a book which uh, I've just written with my colleague, Raymond Boyle, whose name's up on the slide there. Um, Raymond can't be here. He's, he's in Prague talking about Formula One in, to a completely different audience. Um, I was a bit worried when I heard Alan's uh, talk this morning about superstition because I'm wearing green, well, I call them trousers, you call them pants over here. Um, you know, but uh, I haven't shaved, so that was... Back. I'm also the, the I, I counted, I'm the 14th speaker, so that's hopefully <laughs> okay too. Uh, no, so it's about, well, Bill, I think you, you, you overcame the 13th speaker well, I thought. That was brilliant. Um, also, before I start, I, I, I wanted to, I, I, one of the reasons I'm here in the States is I'm talking at a conference um, through in Florida, down in Florida next week, um, and I was able to to hop on a, a, a detour here to Watkins Glen for, for this conference because I thought I really wanted to be here. But um, the, uh, in, in the other the project that I'm involved in, uh, I look at sport reminiscence, which is a kind of therapy that uh, a lot of uh, organizations in Scotland, museums and uh, community groups use. And uh, one of those is from a motor museum for Jim Clark. Um, and Jim raced here in 1965 as then he'd already become the world champion uh, and he also won the Indy 500 in the same year and I think Jim was the first person ever to do that uh, and I mentioned that because the curator at the, at the Jim Clark Museum when I told him I was coming here says you need to tell and remind people that this uh, Scottish farmer was, <laughs> was the first to achieve those, those two great things so I've, I've done that on his behalf and if you ever get the chance to go uh, I don't know if you've been to Scotland if you get a chance to go to Scotland uh, I can't recommend the Jim Clark Museum you know, highly enough. It's a fantastic museum. It's quite a small museum, um, but it has a, a Jaguar D-Type, um, one of his green lotuses that he raced in the 60s, and uh, he remains uh, obviously a, a motorsport legend um, uh, to this day. Okay, as I mentioned, the, the talk is really about the changing relationships between journalists and Formula One. Uh, that's the focus of our book. Uh, I'm mainly going to talk about the kind of historical aspects of that, but also you know, point towards some of the, the contemporary issues that this has raised. Um, we researched the book by inter doing interviews. Uh, we interviewed journalists, both contemporary journalists and journalists that have been in F1 or, or motorsport journalism for many years, many decades in some cases. Uh, and we also spoke to broadcasters, and we spoke to communications managers who work in F1. Um, and one of the reasons we wanted to do this was because we, we I think Ray, neither Raymond nor, or I would say we're, we're experts in motorsport by, by any, man, you know, any means, but um, we're both kind of, you know, the average fan, I guess, of, of F1 for many years. Um, and, uh, but what we noticed as, as kind of uh, uh, researchers of the relationships between media and sport, the F1 is, is, is delivering something different, new, I think, in this relationship. And it may be signposts to where other sports, other global sports, may be heading in, in the future. And I, that was one of the reasons why we were intrigued to explore this with journalists, with broadcasters, with the comms people from within that industry. Uh, and see what they thought, uh, what was going on, because definitely, you know, things have changed in that sport quite, quite radically, certainly since 
Liberty Media took over, of course. <clears throat> so that, that was one, one reason for, for writing the book. Um, the other really is, is, I guess, to look at how the ecology of, uh, the media ecology of sports changed. So we placed the contemporary media relations in a broader historical context. Um, we identified the central role that the media, particularly television, has placed in the history structure and the governance of the sport. Um, and the governance of the sport, um, you know, Bernie Eccleston's been mentioned various times, and he's had his fair share of run-ins with, with the law and governance uh, throughout his reign in Formula One. Um, uh, for a, a used car salesman who uh, is, is recently uh, been charged, well, found guilty of, of tax fraud. Um, who would have guessed a <laughs> ex car salesman would have been charged with that? Um, but certainly, you know, he made obviously Formula One a very uh, intriguing and lively, and I, I guess a kind of business that it became or has become, but arguably it's moved on from his reign and too. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how. Uh, in, in Eccleston's period, um, the media kind of built a certain type of media relation within the sport, which was again was maybe unique. And the sport enters into a kind of digital age of engagement through. Po we heard about podcasts yesterday, obviously even things like uh, TikTok and so on are just awash with co um, content to do with Formula One. Uh, that intense relationship between F1 and the creative industries not only shows us something about where the media are changing, but also how we understand what even the term sport or motorsport means, because I think you know, that there are aspects of, of how the sport is changing because of the media, which again are intriguing and, and, and tell us something a bit different about uh, our relationship with it. So those are the reasons why we wrote the book. And the lights keep dimming on and off, but I'll persevere. Um, but first, um, my historical journey about uh, Formula One begins with, with this guy here who you may have heard of, Murray Walker. Um, he was uh, BBC, BBC and then ITV commentator or announcer, as you'd call here, for many years. For somebody of my generation, Murray Walker was synonymous with motorsport and Formula One. His, his voice... I mean, I can hear it now. It's quite a high screech. Somebody, I think somebody said it was like a, a 500cc motorcycle, kind of high pitch, kind of rev. Um, and, he, and he spoke that quickly as well, uh, very high pitched. He always delivered uh, the picture at the bottom there. He's standing. All of his commentaries were, uh, he was stood up because he, his adrenaline and his excitement at motorsport just came through the microphone. <laughs> Um, but I had the, he's now no, no longer with us, he died in 2021, but when I was researching another book um, on the history of BBC Sport uh, over a decade ago now, in 2008, I had the pleasure of interviewing Murray, uh, which again was a, a kind of interesting experience. Murray's professional career was not in broadcasting at all, it was in advertising, and um, he, he came out of the, uh, he, was, he was involved in the Second World Wars, he, he drove tanks, he was in the tank regiment, and then, uh, as he left, he joined the advertising industry. And uh, again, I don't know if, if the well, Ma obviously you would have heard of Mars Chocolate, and uh, he he had he ran the account for the uh, the ad campaign, which went a Mars a day helps you work, rest, and play. And he, he was in charge of that. I don't know if that means anything whatsoever over <laughs> in in the U.S., but um, that's a very famous slogan from advertising from the the 1970s, and, and Murray was involved in that. But he did commentary part-time, and um, when I interviewed him, he said, well, if, if you ask me how did I get into broadcasting, he said it was nepotism. My, my dad and his dad, Graham, was a, a radio commentator in the 1930s for the BBC and also raced motorbikes, and it was that passion for motorbikes that mainly led Murray to get into broadcasting, and he, so he did it part-time. Um, but one of the most interesting things he said to me, to, to quote in there, and I'll the quote on the, on the slide, he said, I believe motorsport needs explaining more than other sports, partly uh, because most people haven't done it. Whereas with us, other sports, most other sports, they have done it, whether it's, and he, he, he said, cricket, football, soccer, or whatever, uh, tennis. Most people at a participatory level have played these sports, but motorsport is different. Most people haven't done it. Uh, and partly because also the equipment itself 
the technical aspects of the cars or the motorcycles. So it's an interesting quote because I think that still resonates today, doesn't it? That you know, most people have never you know, raced cars and certainly most people have never sat in an F1 car. Uh, so the job of the broadcaster to explain what's going on is quite a difficult one, in a sense, for us, the audience, to, to pick up on that. And that, that plays through into some important aspects of um, how television in particular works in its coverage of motorsport and F1 in particular, and why in the 1970s, that again, we've heard the name James Hunt mentioned, and Murray Walker um, commentated with James Hunt. He very quickly became a kind of the analyst for the BBC coverage of, of uh, Formula One in the 1970s, and also people like Jackie Stewart as well. And today, for Sky Sports, Martin Brundle is probably the most well-known uh, ex-driver that does... does uh, broadcasting for uh, F1 uh, on British television. But for all, all the journalists, broadcasters, and communication professionals we interviewed, the route to becoming an F1 journalist involved elements of luck and happenstance. Really, was the professional journey into F1 journalism by design or straightforward? Rather, journalists followed their instincts uh, of the kind of career that they wanted and developed their craft uh, of journalism and moved quickly when an opening appeared or, or into their chosen career. And another good example of that, apart from Murray's, I guess, um, was uh, Morris Hamilton, again, a well-known uh, motorsport journalist, but also author uh, um, from Ireland. Um, and he explained that as a young man in Ireland, he was very passionate about motorsport and just wanted to get some association with it, to be on the track, at the side of the track, uh, to see his heroes. And so he wrote just randomly as a, uh, a young man to a guy called Ian Young, who was a, a columnist for Auto Car, but also a friend of Bruce McLaren and had so, uh, strong associations with, with the McLaren team. And for whatever reason, um, Ian Yun um, said, well, come over to Britain. Um, and he took him under his wing. He basically, uh, Hamilton was, was kind of held onto his coattails. He was his kind of sideman as of doing kind of uh, coverage and interviews around motorsport and F1 again in particular. And introduced Hamilton to the kind of top tier, to the team managers, to the drivers. Uh, sponsors and so on at a very early age and he said he was incredibly lucky he just happened to be at the right time the right place probably his face just fitted uh, for whatever reason and um, from that very early experience in his early 20s uh, and having that network um, very early in his, his career uh, was able then to become the Guardian's um, motorsport correspondent in the 1970s and then has gone on Still, still is reporting on motorsport uh, decades later. One of the interesting things about motorsport, when just generally you look at it uh, in terms of its relationship with the media, is the longevity of some of the publications within it. Um, and, and some of the journalists that have had really long careers in association with uh, Formula One. Now, so again, some years ago, I was asked to do a, an Oxford Dictionary of National Biography entry for a guy called Bill Boddy, who's uh, the image on there. Uh, and Bill Boddy um, was the editor of Motorsport from 1936 to 1991, and he can continue to write for the, for the, uh, the magazine until his death in 2011. So that was an 81-year career as a journalist in motorsport. And at the time, he was uh, not only the longest serving editor in the British media, but I think the longest serving journalist nonstop in the world, 81 years, which is quite incredible. And so Body was by far and away um, you know, one of the more fascinating characters that I've come across from the world of motorsport journalism. Um, his career began when he visited Brooklands as a young man or a young boy in 1926, and he published his first article on the history of the, the Brooklands um, motor track in 1930. Body developed a career as a freelance motor journalist, and after a brief spell in motorsport, uh, sorry, working in a, a motorcycle shop, his first editorial role came in 1933 as the editor of Brooklyn's Track and Air, for which he also road tested new cars as a passenger because he hadn't passed his driving test. 
The image of, a Grand Prix ra of Grand Prix racing has also been key to our popular imagination of the sport. The brand of Ferrari, for example, is heavily linked to the rise of sport photojournalism in the 1960s. Italian photojournalist Franco Lini was one of the first journalists to travel to all Grand Prix races around the world, reporting for the journal Auto Italiana. Enzo Ferrari was so impressed with Lini's knowledge, his contacts, his multilingual capabilities, that um, he offered him the job of team manager in 1966 and helped in the changing of the, the again, we heard about the image of mo motorsport and the image of the Scuderi from that period. So again, the, the brand and, and uh, the imagery that goes with Ferrari really uh, all links back to the work of Franco Lini and a lot of his photographs from the 50s and 60s. We interviewed a number of former editors and photographers of motorsport magazines who had followed in the footsteps of Body and Linney. This included people like Matt Bishop, uh, who latterly was the comms manager for Aston Martin F1 team, but previously had spent nearly 30 years as a uh, journalist and editor of F1 Racing, uh, which then became GP Racing, now part of the Motorsport Network. And, and he remarked the, uh, about the importance uh, as a, a young boy. He was a, as a, a young boy, a very passionate event, again, about soccer, but and he had a subscription to a soccer magazine uh, as, a, as a young boy. But uh, going in to collect it one day, he saw a copy of uh, Autosport on the shelves, and was just intrigued. Again, I think it was a, an amazing image of an F1 car on the front, probably a bit like the one there. And um, his fascination you know, got the better of him, and he changed his subscription from a soccer magazine to a motorsport magazine, and the rest is history. That forever, from that point on, all he wanted to do, again, was get to get close to the drivers, get close to the cars, uh, and develop a career in, uh, in, 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 the, in the business. I suppose one of the things to say finally about the longevity of some of these titles is that obviously they've had to change as the media ecology has changed. So motorsport is not only a magazine in print, it's a website, it works across different platforms, it does video, it does podcasts, it does uh, lots of social media as well. So again, how the, the longevity of, of motorsport magazines has changed over time has had to change with the technology that delivers them and how people want to read them. The history of broadcasting in F1, and again, um, forgive me, the, the focus here really is on, on the UK. Um, different nations have different kind of broadcasting histories around sport, no, not least in the United States. Uh, and Britain has a quite distinct, I would say, uh, history of broadcasting sport, and particularly motorsport. Um, and that's mainly because the BBC itself, and, and continues to be publicly funded uh, through a license fee and doesn't take advertising, so there's still, although I know if you watch BBC America here, you'll see lots of advertising, but in the UK, still, there's no adver spot advertising between programs on the BBC, even though, you know, it keeps, it arguably works more and more as a commercial type broadcaster in many ways. The first notable radio broadcast on the BBC on the subject of the Grand Prix racing was in August 1926 in a 30-minute talk entitled The Brooklyn's Grand Prix by the engineer and journalist and motoring enthusiast Mervyn O'Gorman. And the talk was broadcast on the eve of Britain's first Grand Prix on the 7th of August, 1926, at Brooklyn's racetrack. On the 1st of October, 1927, the BBC carried its second eyewitness report of the second British Grand Prix, also from Brooklyn's. And on this occasion, the BBC turned to a racing driver called Sammy Davis uh, to provide the account of the race. Uh, Davis had not long returned from winning the 1927 Le Mans 24-hour race, but was also the sports editor of the magazine Autocar and was therefore viewed as someone with both a sporting and journalistic credibility. And I think one of the interesting things about broadcasting in particular and the challenge that sport broadcasters have had ever since you know, the medium was invented was announcers have to have that, that skill of, of being a broadcaster, of kind of being mellifluous, of being able to speak to an audience and explain what's going on. 
but uh, and balance that out with being an expert in the sport. And quite often, or well, increasingly, I would argue that those two roles are kind of split now. Obviously, we have a, an announcer that, that does the play-by-play kind of uh, commentary of explaining what's going on, sat next to or alongside an expert, a former player or fo- former uh, motor racing driver uh, in the case of F1. Um, but that, that, that's the challenge of broadcasting commentary and announcing is, is that balance between expertise in the sport and being an expert broadcaster. And so we see early ex- examples of the BBC trying to do that, I guess, with um, Sammy Davis you know, being a driver, but has also just happened to be a journalist as well. It was not until 1950 that the BBC found its main voice of motorsport with a guy called Raymond Baxter, uh, again, a long-standing uh, broadcaster in the UK, who followed, and he's in the, the image at the top there, talking to Graham Hill um, in, in the middle of that, that, that top image. Um, um, Baxter, uh, again, was what's quite interesting about this period, all these, these guys uh, worked, uh, sorry, not worked, were, were involved in the war in some shape or form. Baxter was a, a fighter pilot in the Second World War, um, but also spent some time working for British Forces Network Radio in Hamburg uh, during his time in the forces. And he entered the BBC um, as their first motoring correspondent in 1946. And now, across radio, he worked across radio and television and was not only active uh, as a broadcaster, but also as a motor racing um, you know, motor racer himself. He competed in 12 Monte Carlo uh, rallies and, uh, and quite often did radio reporting as he was uh, doing, doing the, the racing. One of the interesting asides about the BBC and the Monte Carlo rally is in, I think, I might say 1958, they entered a taxi, a London taxi, <laughs> into the Monte Carlo rally from Glasgow to Monte Carlo. And um, one of the doors fell off uh, as they ent- on the, got on the ramp to go on the ferry across to France. Uh, so they did most of the race without one door. Uh, and then they also went missing. So the, the BBC had put journalists all around the course, uh, you know, along the course of or the route. And uh, the the driver, a guy called Tony Brook, of the of the car, decided, well, there's no way I'm getting a London taxi, you know, around the central massif of of, of the the mountainous area of central France. So I'm going to go round, you know, the flatter course. But the BBC had posted one of its journalists at the top. Of, of the mountains, and they were waiting and waiting and waiting for this car to never that never arrived, and so they posted back to, uh, to to London to say, we think he's crashed, he's he's you know he's disappeared, and it wasn't until he turned up in the Mont- in Monte Carlo that they actually realised that he was still alive, uh, and he, he got a, a rollicking by all accounts by the producer for changing changing his route. But there were headlines in you know the London Times had headlines of BBC BBC. Uh, Taxi goes, you know, disappears in the in the mountains of France. So anyway, that's, that's an aside. But um, so the part because of the challenges, I guess, of of covering motorsport was one of the reasons why um, between the 1950s and 1970s there really wasn't much Formula One racing on television. There was a bit of film coverage. Uh, the BBC did show quite a bit. Again, one of the producers of um, uh, BBC Sport in, the, in this period in the 50s and 60s said to me they used to buy film from America actually of uh, crashes and their editor used to just put them all together in a two minute sequence of just lots of car crashes on, on uh, whether it was a, you know, whatever sort of uh, track it was in, from, from the States because uh, you know, they thought the audience found that entertaining for whatever reason I guess that's one of the appeals maybe of the jeopardy of motorsport on TV um, but if, if we think of, let's think of a uh, sport like boxing, for example, that's relatively straightforward to, to uh, cover because it's what you might call maximum action in a minimal space, uh, whereas motorsport, well, it's maximum action, but it's in a really expansive terrain. You know, just uh, you know, look outside here. Trying to cover that on television or on radio is, is a logistical nightmare. It's a real challenge, even to this day, arguably. So you can post cameras all around a track, 
But um, how you make sense of that for the audience is really difficult. And that was one of the reasons, really, why motorsport didn't uh, take off on television in the, in the UK, certainly in this period, because it was either too expensive uh, to do that um, or, yeah, they just didn't figure out, hadn't figured out how, what the best way of doing it was. Um, so during the early 1950s, Baxter persuaded the BBC also to... Um, to create its own motorsport uh, events. So one of the interesting things is hill climbs is obviously a, uh, was a big thing in, in the UK um, from the 1920s onwards. Uh, and just after the war, Baxter came up with a, a new competition called the BBC Television Trophy. And him and a, a producer came up uh, with a, a bespoke track um, just north of London. So it was easy to get, again, the outside broadcast cameras there, they set the course so that they could strategically place the cameras in the right places and so on. Uh, and this, this lasted for about seven or eight years. And one of the interesting things about it is the image below the, uh, is the trophy there. That, that is a, an, what's called an image orthicon camera, uh, which is the cam main camera that the BBC then used in the 1950s. And so they had an artist, a designer, who designed that trophy. Uh, or, you know, that looked like the camera, and that was first used for as a motor racing trophy. Um, but from 1954, the same trophy was also used for what's called the BBC Sports Personality of the Year, which is still continues to this day. It's one of the most prestigious awards um, that sports what sports people in Britain receive um, from the viewers. So viewers vote for who they want to win that trophy. Uh, and in 1961, we've got Sterling Moss there on the left receiving it. Um, so again, the, the lineage, I guess, of, of a kind of major sporting award has its links back to the BBC trying to create a motorsport event for its cameras, for, it, for itself, um, that it knew it, it would cover. And uh, so it's a nice, nice kind of link back, I guess, to that early history of how broadcasting of motorsport began on the BBC. It's also interesting to note that Formula One drivers or motorsport uh, drivers more generally have won uh, that trophy on uh, eight occasions, I think I'm right in saying, uh, which is only surpassed by athletics. So even, you know, many people would argue that, that football, soccer is the biggest sport in the UK, but in terms of that trophy, it doesn't, it doesn't equate, it doesn't link, and I think partly one of the reasons for that is that motor racing drivers just have that kind of hero factor. The, you know, they're risking their lives. They, they just become kind of heroic figures like Sterling Moss. So the winners uh, include Sterling Moss, John Surtees, Jackie Stewart, Nigel Mansell, Damon Hill, and Lewis Hamilton. And in fact, I think Hill and Hamilton have won it on more than one occasion. So the success of, of that award uh, and the success of F1 drivers in that award is, is maybe suggests or a signpost to the, the broader cultural appeal of F1 uh, to the British public, even though in the, like I say, the 50s, 60s and 70s, they didn't really see very much action of drivers at all. But they continue to be worshipped, I guess, as key sporting heroes within British popular culture. Okay, now the Eccleston part. <laughs> So, like I say, Ber Ber Bernie recently uh, found guilty of tax fraud uh, at the grand old age. I think he's now what, ni about 96 or something, certainly in his 90s. Um, but for many years, obviously, the, the doyen, the, 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 the extrovert uh, controller, owner, commercial entrepreneur of Formula One, and one of the interesting things in talking to the journalists was, and I'm not going to read through them, hopefully you can read them on the screen, there's a number of quotes about how uh, what they perceived was the relationship or the access that journalists had during the Eccleston era. And I think to sum it up is basically that Eccleston just loved newspaper coverage, whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. He didn't really care. But if F1 or his, his name was in the papers, that's all he was interested in. So it didn't have to be a good news story. It could be a bad news story. But it was just getting the visibility of, of uh, F1 out there. He, he liked to be controversial. I think um, Rebecca, Rebecca Clancy, who's one of the few female uh, F1 journalists uh, of, of the moment, uh, of the times, she said they knew Bernie's um, was excellent at creating headlines in F1, it was known as throwing a grenade. So he was well known for throwing a grenade 
all the time, I guess, uh, to get in the news. The ability um, to more or less get access to all areas of the racetrack is one of the major differences of the late 20th century compared to how things develop uh, once press officers and communications managers um, came into the sport. Um, again, to quote um, Morris Hamilton, he said, it was very open um, and, you, <clears throat> and you were on good terms with everybody. You could chat away as they walked along the pit lane. You could talk any time you liked. Similarly with team owners, Colin Chapman less so because he was God and I was terrified of him. But people like Ted Mayer, at McLaren, Ken Tyrrell, for example, you could go and chat to Ken any time about any topic on, on anything. And Hamilton also talked about a time where journalists would turn up at a driver's motorhome and just huddle around uh, a table asking questions. He, he mentioned James Hunt again was one of the, the, the key characters that you could just roll up and just ask him questions. Uh, and they would use those stories to, as the follow-ups for their Tuesday edition. So Monday was for reporting on the weekend racing, um, you know, the, sort of the factual aspects of what happened on the race. But Tuesday was the follow-up of a kind of a... Uh, different kinds of angles and stories. So he said, we all had different thoughts, and so it was really quite good, he recalled. The tabloids would have their different line, and they were reporting on kind of personal angles of the drivers. I might be more interested in how the chassis setup worked or some of the technical details. So he worked to build the relationships with mechanics uh, who would provide you know, insights on how cars were performing and um, in particular cars were running. And he said, now there's... Um, now there's security, you can't get close to them. He said, uh, now they're not allowed to talk to you, they're scared and terrified of breaching their protocols. So I think one of the key things that started to come out of the conversations we were having with journalists was particularly the ones like Morris Hamilton who had been doing it for decades, was they've seen in the last, you know, since, since Eccleston finished actually and Liberty Media took over, is, is a far more control about how the media relations work and the access that they have into the pit lane and with drivers, which is far more kind of controlled and timed on particular days and at particular times. So what that's created is, of course, our kind of media hierarchy. So there's no surprise because television broadcasters pay you know, the lion's share of, of, of the income that uh, F1 receive. I think Sky Sports which is the main broadcaster of F1 in the UK, but also in Germany, Italy, and I think Spain. Um, you know, they are what, literally one of the largest commercial sponsors of F1 at the moment because the amount of money they pay in rights. So there's no surprise that they get first access and in incredible access, really, um, around uh, the paddock. So again, uh, you know, we've got the. Uh, Martin Brundle there talking to Brad Pitt and, and again this, this kind of the, the pre-race walk through and walk around has become synonymous with how Sky cover the sport Martin Brundle is the one that, that leads that and, and the, you know, we're talking about the image of the sport the rub off, rubbing off of uh, celebrities that were also there in the paddock but um, you won't find one single journalist on, on, on that pit lane um, they don't have that access, they're back in uh, some media center somewhere watching it all on screen, uh, unfold on screen. Whereas broadcasters, they're there on the ground, you know, getting really intimate coverage, interviewing drivers if, if they're prepared to talk before the race. Sports writer Richard Williams, again, who wrote a fantastic book, Racers, which is about the 1996 season when Damon Hill won the championship, and a great insight into, again, how one season unfolds and the narrative unfolds around the story. He, he argues that then, so again we're going back to the 1990s um, and, and until maybe t 10 years ago I, I would say that television provided the images but it was the tabloid newspapers that provided the stories for the British public around F1. So until, you know, for, for a good 20, 30 years, newspapers remain important for telling the stories for the angles for, I guess, celebrity culture around sport and, uh, and some of the scandal, of course, uh, around the sport. Um, but he argues that that's now changed, that, that, that newspapers just don't have that leverage anymore. Um, and another interviewee, uh, Andrew Benson, from the BBC, uh, BBC Sport Online, he acknowledged that broadcasters are definitely ranked higher than the written media. 
and uh, that when <coughs> when they were sorry and that where there is high demand for interviews and drivers uh, are selecting who to talk to, they will always go to broadcasters first. They will not choose a journalist, uh, even an online journalist uh, for, for a, you know, a reputable organization like the BBC. They will, they will skip, um, the, overlook those um, and go to the, uh, the, main, the main broadcaster. So fundamentally, they're using the media to expose their brand, he said, uh, as they, uh, they see it, the, which is the part of the complications of the job from the media's perspective, so you can understand why they're going to rank the importance of outlets uh, as far as they're concerned. So the quality of access, what happened in there, the quality of access dictates really both the ranking order but also the quality of the, you know, the, the media representation that any particular outlet can produce. Uh, and so that continues to be a, ma a major struggle for what we might call traditional journalism within F1. I'm conscious that uh, lunch awaits us soon. So to finish off, one of the things, again, no surprises really, uh, as this me the media ecology has, has, has changed, the most significant shift in the media relations has been caused by social media. Many journalists noted frustration with how drivers and teams released information on social media, usually Twitter or X uh, or Instagram, that stands as the final communication on particular events. And Lewis Hamilton has done this on numerous occasions where if he wants to get a message across, across he'll use his social media uh, outlet, but he won't talk to a journalist. He'll just say, if, if a question about whatever the matter is uh, arises, he says, just go and look at my social media, there's my answer. Um, so when questioned further on the information released on social media, drivers are reluctant to expand on the detail, preferring to let their comments and images posted on so social media stand as the final point of communication. Longtime journalist and author Morris Hamilton again believes this has changed everything, and Rebecca Clancy of the Times argues that um, when drivers have their own media outlets, why do they need to talk to us? So to conclude, we would argue that the rise and importance of social media in the last decade or so has cut across the value of traditional news media and accounts of the race. By the time the new newspaper hits the shelves or even the website, the main story of the race has been told and covered on uh, multiple channels, broadcasters and social media with multiple perspectives from different commentators. This has changed the dynamic and become the key factor in both policing behavior, but paradox paradoxically allowing drivers to take greater control of the narratives that surround them. In so doing, it has allowed the drivers and the teams to reach out to a wider audience, many of whom simply do not read newspapers anymore. And there, I'll finish. Thank you, Richard. We're running a little behind uh, at this moment, so we'll take like one or two questions, and that's pretty much all we can fit in right now. Okay. I thought it was great. I thought uh, you started off with Mudley Walker. I love that. Uh, <laughs> and the whole thing. And having been banned by Bernie, I can relate to all this. So anyway, we've got one, two back there. Uh, ig um, and um, ignoring celebrities, uh, celebrities approach him and he simply doesn't even acknowledge their presence, which gets a backlash on social media from people who say, well, how dare he do that? Isn't he a, isn't he a journalist? He's supposed to be talking to these people because they're there at the event. But it's almost like he polices mm -hmm. the access of who's worthy and who's not. I'm just wondering if you have any insights yeah, to that. Yeah, uh, it's a good point. I, I, I think it's, you know, Brundle's obviously of a particular generation of driver and, and um, probably 
his view would be is that I'm an authority on this sport, and although I can see the commercial importance of having, again, all these celebrities and sponsors and corporate interest in the sport, which is all you know, good for the sport in terms of its finances, in terms of, I guess, the, uh, the eth let's call it the ethics of the, of the sport, the route, what the sport's about, the drivers and the racing and the teams, Brundle probably would say, I'm defending that. That's my interest. And, um, you know, if, if you know, Sky want to challenge me on that uh, as, as my employer, it would be fair enough. But he's not going to listen to maybe the, the noise on social media. And I guess that is, that is for all journalists and broadcasters, the noise in social media is loud. You know, there's lots of chatter going on. And so how you cut through that is, is important um, and how the teams and the drivers cut through that actually in terms of managing their, co their communications. But I think that that's probably what, you know, Brundle would say something along those lines is that, you know, I've been there, I've done it, you know, I'm focused on the racing. Um, that's all I'm interested in. I know that I've got to speak to some celebrities now and then, but that's not the main reason I'm here, I'd, I'd imagine. Thank you, Richard. It was great performance. Really enjoyed that. Thank Thanks. you.